Right. Thank you for the reading of the word. And uh, that uh, the song, Jesus Loves Me, I think probably sums up what this passage is really trying to say. So if you don't understand what he's talking about when he's talking about predestination and all that, just remember Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. That's a good way to, to know that. So, uh, trying to break down this passage, it's, it's a, we've been in Romans for several weeks, and this is one of those more debatable, controversial passages. In fact, uh, this subject has been debated by theologians for thousands of years, and we still haven't really settled the matter. And when you ask different people of different denominations, you'll get different answers. And I've studied it from both perspectives. I've studied it from a, uh, from a Calvinist, a Baptist uh, perspective uh, in college, Bible college, and I've studied it from a Wesleyan perspective in seminary. And, you know, I kind of know what I, th what I think about it, but at the same time, I don't think we can fully understand it. I think it's one of those paradoxes where we realize that God knows all things, uh, but yet we have a free will. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. So uh, just know this. There's a few things I want to make mention of here today when, about this passage. First of all, understand that we are known and planned. Let's just start right there. We are known and it's planned. Um, the word predestination, election, can, as I said, elicit all kinds of responses and discussion. And Wesley and Calvin were very close on everything. They agreed on most everything till it come to th this idea here of free will. And Wesley was very, very strong about the fact that he believed that we have a free will. Um, and I think uh, the word itself has cause of confusion. And when you really study it out, uh, as I said, there's good people on both sides. Uh, our, our Calvinist friends would say, well, that means uh, predestination means that God in eternity past chose people out of, other, out of, out of all the people that would ever be born. He chose a number. Those would be the elect that we go to heaven. And by virtue of choosing some, uh, the others are not chosen, so they will not go to heaven. Now, some people call that double predestination, or you could just sim simply say it's like choosing a basketball team. Uh, when you choose 10 people and there's 15 there, uh, by choosing 10, the five are excluded. So some people say that's how God chose you and I, that he looked down through the attorneys of time and based upon his own choice, nothing that we did, that he made a choice that he would choose, that those would be certain people that would be elected and some that would not. That would be a Calvinistic uh, way of, of looking at things. But uh, I, I think... Uh, for our part, uh, you know, understanding, I think Wesley, I think maybe Wesley got it right. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little partial to Wesley, being a, a Wesleyan myself. But uh, understanding, you know, first of all, we don't understand it completely. And we never will probably in this life. But trying to break it down, understanding Wesley's doctrine or thought on provenient grace. Provenient grace really to me explains this uh, a little better in the sense that God knew and God planned. God knew and God planned. Uh, and think of it like this, if it's very hard to understand. Think of it like the parents of a child. When, when a, two people are getting ready to have a child... You know, these days we even know what the baby is going to be and, and all of that. They begin, even before the baby is born, to plan for this child. They begin, they even name the child. They will pick out, uh, you know, rooms, uh, colors for the room. They'll paint the room. They'll get the baby bed ready. And they are planning. They know 
this child is coming, and they're planning for this child. And so they spend time together as they're trying to anticipate the coming. And even after the child comes, they still help plan for the future. Now they may say, they may have plans that say, I, I want this child to go to UK. And, and the child may grow up and go to uh, University of Louisville. That may be disappointing to them. They had a plan, but the child has a free will at the same time. And sometimes that happens with us. God has a plan for our life. God has decided that He wants us to have a relationship with Him. And He has uh, got everything prepared and ready for us. But at the same time, we have a free will. And we can choose to go one way or the other. God, uh, you know, if you think about the idea of prevenient grace, though, Prevenient grace says that God's grace goes before us and woos us and, and works in our lives to bring us to Him even before we come to salvation and understanding of that. And so God knew. God knew we were coming. God prepared for us and He planned for that. So understand that we are known and planned. Now, you can make more out of that than you want to. You can take it further than you want to. But just know that we're known. And we're playing. And just like parents would plan and anticipate the arrival of their child, what an exciting time that would be. God has planned and anticipated our arrival, not only in birth, but in coming to Him and being in heaven. That's a wonderful thing. So we're known and playing. Number two, uh, understand that we are called and we are claimed. We're called and acclaimed. So he says, those whom he called, he also uh, justified. And the idea there that, that God has called, and, and this call goes out. And, and again, you can get bogged down with the details of that. And I'm not going to do that this morning, but to say that, that there is this call that goes out to all. Whosoever will, let them come. And uh, when you come... God claims you for His own. If you come, you, you know that God has, uh, you are one of the elect because you have been, uh, ex you, you accepted God and He accepted you. Just this past week, I was uh, called to the hospital. Uh, actually, on my time off, I went over there. And uh, there was a, a person, I'm not going to say if it was a man or a woman, but this individual said to me, that they uh, realized that they had uh, cancer that was uh, incurable. It only had so long to live, according to this, the doctors, what they don't really know, but what they're estimating. And he wanted to make things right with God, this person. And so when they did that, they said, you know, I, I, I feel like I need to make my peace with God. I, I feel like maybe God is ashamed of me. And I began to talk about how God was just longing and waiting for this moment. That, that God wanted to, to uh, save her or him. And God wanted a relationship with this person. And what a wonderful thing to be able to share that God was waiting for them, planning for them, that He was calling them. And I was able to baptize this person right there in the room. What a, a wonderful thing. God calls us to Him. Um, years ago, several years ago, there was a study done at John Hopkins University where the professor had the students go out into the community and wanted them to, based upon the studies of the community and what they, they found there, to determine or make a prediction how that the children would turn out later in life. And so these university students went out and did a study in the slums of New York, I think it was. And they, thinking, understanding that these kids were being brought up in poverty and, and all of the crime that was around them, predicted that uh, probably 90% or more of them would end up in jail. Well, some years later, the same professor had his new students go out and do a study on these same kids that they had predicted that would end up in jail. And what they found was, as they found, tracked down these people, 
that only four of them had ever been to jail out of like a hundred people or more, only four. And here's what they discovered. As they talked to them, they found out that each one of these ones, each one of the people that they, they were wrong about, had a teacher by the name of Sheila O'Rourke. And this particular teacher had been such an influence in their lives that it changed really their destiny. They found this teacher, Mrs. O'Rourke, in a nursing home. And they asked her, what was the secret? What, what did you do that caused such a change and have a success in the lives of these young people? She was bumfuzzled and she's like, all I did was love every one of them. What a difference love can make. If we could just learn that lesson. I've been preaching that for a long time, but if we could learn, we can get more people by love than we can by hate every time. And, you know, Jesus showed that to us. All He did was love us. And that love compels us and draws us to Him. When He died upon the cross, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us, that we might become righteous. What love was displayed on Calvary. What a wonderful thing. So we're called and claimed. And number three, I want to say that we are held and strengthened. We are held and strengthened. Uh, he says in that verse, as we want to turn there, look at that again. In Romans chapter 8, he says in chapter 8, As we've been looking at this, we think about, uh, we started out a few weeks ago and talked about those there now, no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So we don't have to fear. And he talks about not having fear of bondage, again to bondage, but we cry, Abba, Father, we're children of God, and if we're children, we're heirs. And now he begins by talking about, you know, that uh, even though we may suffer, it's not anything compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us later. And he says uh, that we know that all things work together, in verse 28, for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. All things, uh, probably uh, one, if you have a version that says all things work together uh, in our good or for our good, there's different versions, but the idea really is that God is working in all things. I think that's the idea there. That in all things, God is working to bring good out of it. Not that all things are good are going to happen to you, but that in all things, God, are, God is in the business of working it out to make things good for us, to those who are called to, according to His purpose. And then He says, he, those who foreknew, He pressed, predestined. Uh, and those He predestined, He called. And those He called, He justified. And whom He justified, He also glorified. And the idea there that, that we, got, in God's mind, we, we've already, it's already a done deal. God is planning it, even our glorification. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall we not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. So there's no condemnation. That He's continuing that idea. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he lists a whole bunch of things. And he says, no, in all these things we're more than conquerors through Him who loved us. And he mentions at the end there that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. More than conquerors. We're held and we're strengthened by God. There was a story in Christian uh, parenting today about a lady who was talking to her little girl one night, her little girl Eva, before she went to bed, and, and was talking about uh, a friend of hers had a daughter whose name was Amy, whose hair was falling out. 
and she asked, she said, let's pray for Amy because her hair keeps falling out. And so Eva began to pray for Amy um, pretty much every night. God, please hold on to Amy's, the hair on her head. And every night she'd pray that prayer. Finally, they found the problem and realized that Amy had a condition, a very rare condition, that was incurable and that the hair would continue to fall out. And so finally, when the mother told uh, Eva this, she, she prayed this. She said, Lord, if you're not going to hold the hair on Amy's head, will you hold Amy? Will you just hold Amy? And I'm so glad today that even when our hair is falling out and our lives may be seemingly falling apart, God holds us. God con continues. And it's a wonderful thing. As I was uh, do performing this baptism and pouring the water over the head of this person in the hospital, it was just a wonderful thing to feel the presence of God in this place. And God's presence is so wonderful. And sometimes I just want to be held. Sometimes I just want God to wrap me in His arms and hold me in His loving arms. So know today that you're, you are known and you're planned, that you're called and you're claimed, and that you're held and you're strengthened by God's loving arms today. That's the main thing that I, I want you to see in this passage today. God loves you and He wants a relationship with you. And He's planning for that. And so when we come to God, uh, just like this person who was baptized, understand, God's not standing there like the prodigal son's father. He, he's not standing there just saying, what are you doing coming to me? You're dirty. You stink. You, you've done all kinds of bad things. That's what we think. That's what the prodigal thought. But instead, God is wringing His hands, walking out on His front porch, looking over the hills, to see when his child is going to return. He's waiting for you. He's planning for your arrival. So why don't you come to him today? As your musicians come today, we get ready to sing. I want to invite you to pray right where you are. We call it the sinner's prayer. We call it the Jesus prayer. But you can say it in your own words, but it's something simple as this. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, be merciful to me, a sinner. If you pray that prayer and you mean it from your heart, God has promised He would not turn you away. And I invite you to do that today. I just want to uh, say today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.